two-year college system for th for this program to stay accredited. I also put those there is because they're a great way for you to know what we're going to cover and they're also a good way for you to go back and study that so that when you um, are listening to the lecture again if you've recorded it when you're going back through your notes that you're going through and you're answering these questions, you're making sure you can find this information or you understand that information. So I put them at the beginning of all of, of my PowerPoints um, there. A couple interesting things about burns. First of all, 75% of all fatalities of, uh, for, from burns occur before the patient arrives to the hospital. So what do you think causes 75% of all fatalities with burns? It is respiratory, it is smoke inhalation, is where we see the majority of our fatalities with burns. Um, and so we have to talk about preventing, of, um, preventing these burns. And so we start with health promotion, some of the ways that we can prevent burns. Of course, they're all there. I'm not going to explain all of them to you. Most of them will are self-explanatory. Um, but a couple of things that we see quite a bit of is firework injuries. Um, I have a 10 year old and he thinks it's the best thing in the world to shoot fireworks at someone uh, <laughs> instead of in the air. We tend to see that. Um, I've taken care of kids that have lost eyes because of fireworks. So we tend to see these um, things, proper storage of combustibles, we're moving into some warm summers. Uh, I just was listening to, I guess it was the radio, and they were talking about um, temperatures in the um, west this week, 115 and 120 degrees in parts of Arizona and California this, this week. Um, we just feel like we're dying here with 100% humidity, um, but they, we have temperatures that if you have improper storage of combustibles, what you're going to see is those paint cans or um, that will explode in temperatures like that. Space heaters is another big one we see, um, especially in uh, this area in cooler months, winter months, usually with somebody on a fixed income. So we have an older patient that's on a fixed income. They may choose not to turn on their central heat. They're just going to heat up the room that they're in. And so they turn on a space heater. Well, those space heaters tend to go bad. The safeties in them will go bad. So when they fall over, they don't turn off or they're running a space heater to heat the entire house when it's not designed for that. It's designed for a small space. And um, they overuse them and they short out or they catch on fire. Um, we also see burns with our diabetics in space heaters because they get cold, their feet have neuropathy, and they go and put their little feet right there in front of that space heater to try to warm up. And they have no idea that they're burning their feet with the space heater as they're sitting there um, trying to warm up for, the, for cooler months. So we do see burns with space heaters. Now I will tell you, in this area, we don't keep a whole lot of burns. Like if a patient has major burns, um, even moderate burns, we don't keep them. We ship them out. We are not, we don't have a burn facility in this area. We are not designed to take care of uh, big burn patients uh, like some of the other areas in, uh, around us. So we do ship a lot of our burns out in this area. So let's talk about the types of burns. Just, let's see if this works. Oh, yeah. All right, so let's talk about types of burns. We're gonna look at um, several types of burns. The bur first being our thermal burns. And when we talk about thermal burns, we're really kind of talking about the fire itself when we think thermal. So there's several different ways that we can come in contact with that thermal burn. When we say a dry heat, that is the flame. That is the fireplace flame that's out of a grill that we've touched that come in contact with that flame. Something's caught on fire on the stove and we've come in contact with the flame. That is that dry heat. Um, thermal or thermal burn. We also have moist heat. And so when we think moist heat, I tend to think about scalds. Think about a boiling water, a boiling pot of water on the stove. You go to take the lid off and that nice big puff of steam that comes up catches your forearm and your forearm's red for a little while. That is that moist heat. Um, and then contact thermal burns is where you come in contact with a 
a substance that is hot in temperature, an iron, um, grease, um, tar, uh, anything that conducts heat and you come in contact with it. This couple weekends ago, it was the pavement on the road. I was walking barefooted coming back from the beach, thought that and that was still a great idea to keep my flip flops off because I had sand all over my feet. And um, got on a boardwalk and then on the, to the asphalt, and guess what? It was hot. It was warm. Um, so that is where you see those contact thermal burns. We also have electrical burns. Now, electrical burns can be deceptive. And they can be deceptive because when you actually just physically assess the patient and look at them, there is not a large entry point and exit point. There's not a large burn area, but they have massive internal damage. So when we talk about grand masquerader, it is just that. They have small entry points, they have small exit points, but there is massive internal damage to the patient because that electrical current has traveled through the entire body. <laughs> With electrical burns, you also have to consider cardiac issues. Uh, because there is an electrical current that moves through the body, we have to worry about something called R on T phenomenon. And it is truly R on T. That marker stinks. All right, so R on T. That is an early depolarization that causes the R wave to fall on the T wave. Puts the patient in VTAC or VFib. And so now we have a lethal rhythm, cardiac rhythm. With chemical burns, you have to think about a pH scale. Uh, remember neutral is that 7.4 on a pH scale. Anything less than that, we move to the acid side. Anything higher than that, we move to the base side of a pH scale. And the further you move away from neutral, the more likely you are to have a burn, either direction. It doesn't just have to be an acid. So we tend to think chemical burns acids, um, chlorine, um, we, we see a lot of um, acids used with pool cleaning, those type things. So we tend to think that low pH. However, lots of cleaning supplies will cause burns, and they're actually, they have a high pH. So if you ever used a cleaning supply and you got done and you felt like your fingers were slick, that there was something still on your hands, that is actually where that... Um, cleaning supply has emulsified or liquefied the skin proteins um, and caused damage to the outer layer of the skin. And so that's what you're getting is that slick feeling on your fingers. So the further you move away from neutral, whether that's to the acid side or to the base side or the alkaline side, um, you're going to see burns with uh, different chemicals. So we will talk about how we treat these chemicals. Um, if you have an acid, what do you think you do with an acid? Okay, so how would you neutralize it? Not necessarily with a base. The unique thing about an acid is, is you can dilute it out. So think about chlorine. Get it on your skin, you start rinsing it. You dilute it down and, I mean, let's remember we drink chlorine. They put chlorine in the water that we drink. So you can dilute it down to the point that it's safe. So with acids, you typically just dilute them. Flush, 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 lots of saline. We're going to get it off the skin by washing it and diluting it down. That is not the case with an alkaline substance. Like I mentioned, an alkaline substance will actually um, liquefy human proteins, skin proteins, and if you put water on it, it's going to push that alkaline substance further into the skin, causing deeper burns into the skin. Alkaline substances, that base side, 
we are going to look at a way to neutralize it using an MSDS. We're going to look at what is appropriate for that chemical and use that to, to neutralize the chemical. And then we have to look at radiation burns. We see lots of radiation burns from what? Sunburn. Not necessarily sunburns. That's going to be thermal. Cancer treatment. Cancer treatment. All right. Cancer so we see lots of um, radiation burns with cancer treatment. We can see it with work as well. Um, we have the nuclear plant not far from us. We have the potential of radiation exposure. Um, remember, every time a patient goes to x-ray and to CAT scan, we are exposing them to low doses of radiation, but we have it in the hospital um, all over the place. So we can see radiation burns as well. Typically, when we are taking care of a patient with a radiation burn, it is typically somebody receiving radiation for cancer treatment um, that we see radiation burns. With radiation burns, um, if there is a radiation exposure um, where they actually have the radiation on them, we have to look at decontamination areas. We have to make sure that they are rinsed, that that radiation comes off of the patient. Because if we allow the patient into our ER with radiation on them, what are they doing? They're exposing everybody, They're exposing everybody else to radiation. So we had um, drills with the nuclear plant where we do radiation exposures. There's been an uh, accident at the nuclear plant and patients come in with radiation exposure. Uh, we can use Geiger counters to, to detect radiation on the patient to see how much radiation they're admitting. We have to wash them in specific showers. And what does that really consist of? It's really a holding tank that that water goes into. It cannot go back into the city water system. It can't just be washed down a drain. Um, so we wash them off in showers in these drills outside the ER. Um, and that water is held into, into tanks or holding bins so that it can be disposed of properly. And once we wash them off, we remove the radiation off of them. We scan them with Geiger counters to check to see how much radiation they're emitting. We then put them inside the ER, but typically we try to put them in lead rooms. We try to use radiology type rooms to put them in. So if they're still admitting radiation themselves, we are limiting the exposure of other patients. into burns, we need to understand what, what we're looking at. So let's do some anatomy and physiology review really quick. We're not going to go too deep into it, but just to refresh your memory on it. When we are talking about burns uh, to, the, to the integumentary system and to the skin, uh, we look at two major layers of the skin. We look at the epidermis, which is the outermost layer of the skin, and then we look at the dermal layer which is also known as the true skin or the living skin. It is the living layer of the skin. Why? This is where everything occurs in that dermal layer. It's a much thicker layer than the epidermis, and but this is where we also have um, nerve endings. This is where we have sebaceous glands. This is where we have hair follicles. This is where we have blood flow to the skin is in that dermal layer. So <coughs> it is the functional layer of the skin. When we talk about the function of the skin, um, there's a lot of things that the skin does for us that we don't always think about. So Chloe, if we think about the skin, what sort of thing the skin would do for you? Um, it's a barrier. Okay, a barrier for what? Um, You're right, it is. It's just like, Okay, so a barrier to keep bacteria from coming in, to keep us healthy, to keep us safe, right? All right? It also helps us thermoregulate, and we'll talk about that with these large burn areas. It is a sensory organ because we do have nerve endings there, 
But let's go back to barrier. Not only does it help protect us from the outside, our body from the outside environment, keeps us from getting sick on a daily basis, it also keeps fluid and electrolytes in. And this is where hypovolemic shock comes into play with burns. So we always tend to think about the skin being the barrier to protect us from the outside world. But that barrier, when it's gone, we have no way to keep fluid and electrolytes inside the body. So when we start seeing fluid shifting in the patient with burns, because remember we, um, we talked about that they're going to have two types of shock. What did I tell you they were? Distributive and hypovolemic. So distributive means what? Because you talked about it with sepsis, what is distributive? So it's going to the body, so it's leaving the vascular system, fluids are leaving the vascular system and just moving to interstitial space, right? So the patient might start swelling. We're gonna see that skin get nice and tight and thick on, or, or full on the patient. But on the burn patient, that skin's gone. So that barrier is not there to hold the fluid in the body in that interstitial space. So now that is where the patient transitions from a um, distributive shock to a hypovolemic shock because the, the volume leaves the body. It doesn't stay. So that is why we see both shocks in the burn patient because the barrier function of the skin is gone. We have areas of the body that are extremely thin skinned. Jay, tell me an area of the body that's got thin skin. Um, our palms or? Our hands. Yeah. Hands. Have you ever thought about the skin on your hands? There's not a whole lot of skin there. All right, somewhere else. Anybody else have any what? Okay. okay, so we have prom bony prominence. It's usually there's a little less tissue there. Okay, hands, feet. The face. Yes, eyelids, ears, nose, and then the genitalia area. The peritoneal area is very thin skinned. So when we have burns to those areas, we're gonna see a much more severe burn than we might of the abdomen or of the thighs or of the back. We're gonna see a much deeper burn in those areas so they, because they, that skin is so much uh, thinner. So we're going to talk about burns, and you've probably heard burns classified how? Somebody talked about a burn, they told you what, what it was what? It was, it was what now? They talked about what degree. Okay, what degree? They might have used first degree, second degree, third degree, or even fourth degree burns. Those exist. There's no doubt about it. We use those terms, but we're going to also learn what depth of the burn is in association with those degrees. So when we talk about a superficial burn, we are talking about a first degree burn. Superficial burns, and we're gonna go through all of these individually. Um, superficial burns affect only the epidermis. So we just talked about the epidermis. Does it have a whole lot of function? No, no it doesn't. It's very thin layer, doesn't have a whole lot of function. So those are those first degree burns. When we look at partial thickness burns, there are two types of partial thickness burns. There are superficial partial thickness and there are deep partial thickness burns. Partial thickness burns are your second degree burns. They're partial thickness. So that means they're this, the epidermis and part of the dermal layer. Some part of it. We're going to get specific as to what part of the dermal layer they are. But they're partial thickness. We have affected that dermal layer. We look at full thickness burns. That is your third degree burns. And then in some cases you hear fourth degree, but that is that deep full thickness. Some people just call them third degree, but we do. There is a fourth degree in burns. So when we determine the severity of a burn, we have to use two things. How deep is it? And how much of the body does it cover? Like that's gonna tell us how severe the burn is. So those two things tell you the severity. How deep the burn is 
and the total body surface area that is covered. How do we determine total body surface area? We're going to use the rule of nines. There's several ways. There's several different um, formulas. There's several different uh, charts out there. We will use the rule of nines. The reason being, if you haven't already, you will see the rule of nines in 204. You will test on it in 204. You'll test on it for burns and sepsis in 203. You'll test on it on our final exam. You'll test on it in your final comprehensive predictors in 204. And you will test on the rule of nines on boards. It's there. I have students every semester right now coming back to us telling us that the rule of nines is on boards. So, oh, by the way, you had a student that tested just last week 90 questions. Guess how many of them were select all that apply? 33. A third of their test was select all that apply. That's punishment. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It is. A third of their tests was select all that apply. You had 50 questions on module A. How many of them were select all that apply? Less than 10%, I can assure you, because that's what we put on our tests, less than 10%. So 50 questions, less than five or so were probably select all that apply. Could you have imagined having 15 of your questions as select all that apply? So what does that tell us about boards? What are they, what, what are they gonna do? They're going to make sure you know it. And they're going to do that with select all that apply questions. Why? They can cover more grounds with a select all that apply questions than they can with a multiple choice question. What is that moving us to? That's moving us to that next gen case study type test that they're moving to. So a third of boards right now, they're running with select all that apply questions. But back to, to rule of nines. <laughs> rule of nines is on there. So you have to know the adult rule of nines. Can I steal your piece of paper for a second? Yes, ma'am. You're so prepared. I'm so impressed. All right, so the rule of nines is everywhere in module F. If you haven't found it yet, it is because you're blind. It is on the PowerPoint. It is there as individual documents. It is in the extra material. It is in your book. It is in ATI. I am presenting it to you today. I will present it to you this afternoon in simulation. I will have given you the rule of nines every way I know how to do it, except maybe standing on my head to tell you that you have to know the adult rule of nines. Did you know that I will still have at least two of you miss rule of nines on my test? Mm -hmm. Statistically, every semester, I have usually about six, but I have two groups. So I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. There'll be two of you that'll miss the rule of nines. You don't need to know the infant rule of nines. You don't need to know the child. You have to know the adult rule of nines. Now, what trips people up with the rule of nines is there's an anterior and a posterior side to the rule of nines. If you add it up, anterior and posterior, you get 100% of the total body surface area. But they just break it out in nines. And so you have to know those. I'm gonna show you several ways to work the rule of nines because of percentage, uh, if the patient's completely burned in that area or not, those type things. We'll get to that. Don't know that we'll get to it today, but we'll get there. But I'm telling you, know your rule of nines. So total body surface area and the depth of the burn give us the severity of the burn. So let's look at some of these. All right, so superficial burns. Remember I told you that superficial burns might be what they might call a first degree. You will not see degrees anywhere testing-wise. You won't see it in 203, you won't see it in 204, and you won't see it on boards. They don't use degrees in those areas. Um, they call them superficial, partial thickness, full thickness type burns. So superficial thickness burns are the epidermal layer. It is that outermost layer um, it does not affect the dermis. And so what we see is typically something that is red. They might have some mild edema, depending on how much of the body surface area is burned. Um, patients that have superficial thickness burns don't get admitted to our facilities. They don't, they don't stay. Even at 100% of their total body surface area, they don't stay. Because the depth of the burn is, is very minute. We're talking about that dead or that outermost layer of the skin anyway. 
So red, they can be slightly painful. Ever had a sunburn? You know what an epi, uh, epidural, uh, epidermal burn is? Um, you'll peel in a couple of days. They heal on their own, typically without scarring. We just don't typically see any problems with them. Um, they are uncomfortable is the big thing with the superficial thickness burns that affect the epidermis. This is an example of a superficial burn, just a sunburn. And then we move to partial thickness. So as we move down that list, we're going to get deeper into the burn area. So a partial thickness is the epidermis and part of the dermis, specifically the top third of the dermal layer, or the outermost third of the dermal layer. So the epidermis and the top third of the dermal layer is affected with a superficial partial thickness burn. Now, what makes them look different than the um, superficial burn is we will see blisters with these. So we have affected the dermis, and so these capillary beds start leaking plasma. The dead layer of skin above it is really thin, and so that plasma comes to the surface and kind of bubbles up, causing the blister that we see, because we've affected the capillary beds in that dermal layer. Now that we've hit the dermal layer, do you think these burns hurt worse than superficial burns? Absolutely. They are more painful because now we're affecting nerve endings because we're in that dermal layer. <coughs> These burns will look red, they will look moist, they will have blisters, and they will be painful. These patients will have some swelling, more so than what we saw with the superficial burns. They will usually, they will heal on their own, usually two to three weeks. There's typically not any scarring. However, there is the potential for a pigment change. Many times we don't see it because we're only talking about the upper third of the dermal layer, but because we are affecting the dermal layer, the potential for a pigment change is there in the skin color. of patients with, with burns. What have you heard about blisters? Do we leave them alone or do we open them? We leave them alone. We leave them alone because they are actually protecting the new skin that's growing underneath them. They are sterile. Now there are some exceptions to that. If we have a blister that no longer looks clear and looks like it's infected, we will open those up. Or if we have extremely large blisters, especially around joints, um, we might open those up. But the majority of our blisters, we leave alone. We want to keep them intact. We want to keep them um, just like they are. We want that blister to stay there because it is protecting the skin underneath it. Some areas <coughs> of superficial partial thickness burns. You can see the blisters here. Um, you can see where there was a blister there, but it still has that very moist, wet look to it. Um, both of those are superficial partial thickness. And then we move to deep partial thickness. And deep partial thickness, um, it is the epidermis and two thirds of the dermal layer. So the majority of the dermal layer is now affected. These burns no longer look wet. They look very dry. They'll be red with white patching. They will not have blisters. They have a very dry color to them. They have pretty severe edema. That edema is increasing with these. However, their pain may be less than that of the superficial partial thickness burn. So now why do you think the pain's less? Nerves. Because they've affected more of the nerve endings. So there are nerves, because we've hit the majority of that dermal layer, we've 
affected the majority of the nerves in that, that area, so there's going to be less pain there. Because there's less pain, does that mean there's less damage? No. No. As a matter of fact, the, more, uh, the less pain they have, probably the more damage there is. These burns have the potential to kind of hold heat. That's why you may see them progress. Um, that burn area itself um, is almost like, not really a conductor, but it kind of holds heat. So then it affects the other tissue around it. Um, as we start cleaning these, as we start debriding these, you'll start seeing areas that are, um, that you might not have thought was affected that are um, with these. These burns can also still heal on their own. Now, not quickly. Um, usually six, eight weeks or so, it would take one of these burns to heal on their own. The reason they have the potential to heal on their own is because we do still have some part of the dermal layer intact. As long as you have any part of the dermal layer intact, <coughs> that burn has the potential to heal on its own but we're talking eight or 12 weeks later. So three months, it might take one of these burns to heal on their own. Many times what you see with these deep partial thickness burns is that you will go ahead and you'll still have physicians that will go in and they'll debride this. They'll get rid of all that burn, dead tissue, and they'll start getting that area ready for a skin graft. Because if we can get a skin graft on it, we're gonna have it covered much sooner than we would if we let it heal on its own. So by covering it much sooner and getting a skin graft on it, what are we decreasing their chances of? Infection. So to cut down on their potential for infection, they will many times debreed these and cover these with grafts. And then we have full thickness burns. So this is all of the epidermis and all of the dermal layer. These wounds will not heal on their own. They will not heal without skin grafting. We have to intervene with full thickness burns because there's no dermal layer left. These look very dry and leathery. For some reason, when I think about full fitness burns, I tend to think of like beef jerky. That very dry, hard, almost peppery. <laughs> like that is what I think of when I think of a full thickness burn. Um, not it has not deterred me from eating beef jerky. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, that is kind of that, it is, it, they call it escar is what they call it. Um, Escar is that dried, burnt, coagulated tissue that we have with full thickness burns. Escar can become a problem with circulation and breathing for patients when we have circumferential burns. All right, so somebody tell me what circumferential is. All the way around. Yes, so we can see circumferential burns around the arm. We can see circumferential burns around the leg. We can see circumferential burns around the torso of the body. So this, with this full thickness burn, they have, let's say, let's look at this gentleman right here in the top picture for a second. He does not have a circumferential burn. We see it just as part of his chest wall, not his entire chest. However, let's think about him for just a second and assume that they have a full thickness burn completely around their chest. That burnt, coagulated, hard, leathery tissue is around their chest. It doesn't expand, it doesn't contract, there's no movement to that skin. And we know that what's gonna happen with, with fluids in the body of a burn patient. We haven't gotten there yet, but because they have distributive shock, that fluid does what? It moves. It moves to interstitial space. So they start swelling. However, is that tissue going to give with swelling? No, no it's not because it's very fixed. It's almost like a cast. Um, 
is what I, I tend to think about. If you think about a cast on an arm, that we put that cast on, that burnt coagulated tissue, that eschar is there. It's this nice tight cast, and now that arm is going to start swelling because it's injured, and we have a fluid shift. Well, what happens to distal circulation? It decreases. It decreases. We cut it off. So they will start having pain distally if it's the arm. But when we talk about the chest, think about taking a good deep breath. You take a deep breath, what happens to the chest wall? It expands. They have this s bar around their chest wall. They try to take a deep breath. Are they able to do that? No. They are not. So these patients with circumferential injuries to the chest end up in respiratory distress because they have, they've lost their volume. So the ones of you that are in ICU clinicals now and you've had a patient on vents and you've looked at their tidal volume, which is the amount of volume air that we're putting to, into their lungs with each breath. What have your vents been set on for tidal volume? Somewhere around 500 is what they are. 500, 550, your men will be a little higher than that. Your women might be a little less than that. But usually somewhere around that 500 is what you have in tidal volume. You can have patients with SCAR and that tidal volume will drop to 100. So where we were getting 500 of air in, now we're only getting 100 of air. So we're, getting, we're having a patient in respiratory distress. Many times with full thickness burns, especially if we have full thickness burns of the chest, the patient will be intubated. We'll prophylactically intubate these patients. So guess what will start beeping on you if you start having a decrease in that volume because of SCAR? That, uh, that vent's gonna start alarming on you. You're gonna start hearing the, those vent alarms and it's gonna start telling you high pressure, high pressure. Well, why is it telling you high pressure? Because they're not getting enough volume in. It's because they're, the vent is meeting resistance. And so the lungs aren't expanding and so there is a high pressure there that, they, that the, it's not overcoming. So you'll get high pressure alarms with patients that have circumferential injuries of the chest wall. <coughs> with circumferential injuries of arms and legs, you have to look at peripheral or distal circulation. You have to look at um, one, are they complaining of pain? Is it swelling? Is the color change? Is there a color change? Is it starting to look pale or even blue in that, that color? You've got to look at capillary refills. You've got to look at those type of things for peripheral or distal circulation past the um, SCAR. Because this SCAR <coughs> can constrict and restrict um, blood flow and chest expansion, we may have to do an escarotomy or a fasciotomy. When have you heard about a fasciotomy? Compartment syndrome. So a patient with compartment syndrome, what typically happens with compartment syndrome? They have some type of injury, usually to usually a long bone. It's usually legs, it can be an arm. I have taken care of a patient with compartment syndrome of the abdomen, she did die. Um, she was, um, hold on, God, I'm 42, not 62. Um, she was uh, sickle cell anemia. She was sickle cell, came in in a sickle cell crisis. Um, typically we hear about sickle cell hurting in joints because of the lack of blood flow. Um, hit the mesenteric artery in her abdomen, blocked the mesenteric artery, and basically her intestines started dying. And she developed compartment syndrome of the abdomen. Um, so you can have compartment syndrome of the abdomen, um, but we typically see it in arms or legs. But compartment syndrome, they start having this m massive amount of swelling, and essentially the skin's doing the same thing. The skin's kind of holding that swelling, um, confining that swelling, and so we start cutting off blood supply versus allowing the swelling. When we do a fasciotomy, what do we do? We cut into the tissue. We cut to the fascia. Right? Where does the fascia sit? Above where? Below the dermis. It is below the dermis. Where does the fascia sit in the body? Where is it? It sits on top of the muscle. Yes. 
It is that thin layer of tissue that sits on top of the muscle. So we cut through the fascia for a fasciotomy. Well, the same thing here. An escarotomy, we cut through the escar. A fasciotomy, we cut through the escar, through any subcutaneous tissue, and through the fascia. So the only thing that we haven't cut is the muscles. So we stop at that fascia layer. Both of those are intended to allow for chest expansion and or blood flow. That is also a full thickness burn. That is a circumferential burn. We would have to worry about um, <clears throat> peripheral circulation to his hand. So when we talk about escarotomies or fasciotomies, um, the picture on the left is an escarotomy. They are cutting through the escar of the chest wall. Typically, we cut down both lateral sides of the chest because we've got to allow for chest expansion. Now, the chest will still be hard, like you can tap on it and it's going to sound like this table. The same thing with the back. Um, but we cut down the sides and it allows for chest expansion. With fasciotomies, it's usually just a single cut um, with a fasciotomy um, of an extremity, but with the chest, it's both sides of the chest. <clears throat> Um, you said that you don't, like, just because we don't have a burn unit around here and we don't keep patients, you know, you send them out. But obviously, like, if a patient comes in or if there's a trauma situation, mm -hmm. if they're a severe enough burn, are they just going to automatically send them? Or are they we have to have them stable enough to oh, send okay. them. Okay, well, that's what I was wondering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they would, in a case like that, so they had to do, they would treat them if they had to do they would, that, get most, them stable and then. Yes, and fasciotomy, um, escalotomies like that will be done at bedside. They'll, they'll cut them open in the ER on both sides. Um, stabilize them because that allows for chest expansion. Remember, they don't have any sense, um, any sensation in that. It's dead. So all we're doing is just cutting through dead tissue. They, they have no clue that we're cutting um, straight down the lateral sides of their body. It still hurts me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but yeah, we have to stabilize them. We can't. Um, we don't trace. We try not to send out unstable patients. We want them to make it to their destination. Because remember, when you transfer a patient out of your facility, you have limited their resources. The manpower that they have, the equipment that they have, the drugs that they have access to, the physicians that they have access to. When you take them from a facility and put them on an ambulance or a helicopter or a jet, you have limited their resources. So you want them as stable as possible to make it from point A to point B with those limited resources. You don't want to take one of these patients up that's on the verge of coding that's got a decreased um, tidal volume that and leave them in that state and not because they're not going to make it to their destination. So if we can stabilize them, we can intubate them, we can sedate them, we can do escarotomies on them, we can start the Parkland formula with fluid resuscitation, we're going to do all of that to get hopefully to get them to their, their location. <coughs> All right, and then we have deep, full thickness burns. And when we talk about deep, full thickness, we are now talking about burns that move not only through all of the skin layers, but now we are looking at the fascia, muscles, tendons, and bones that are burned. These burns are usually very blackened and depressed. This burn in the bottom is a full, thick, deep, full thickness burn before surgery. So... We see some of these, typically it's things like a motorcycle that's laid over and the muffler has burned into the skin or they've been ejected from a vehicle and the, the, um, they've laid under the vehicle and some part of the uh, muffler has burned them in the vehicle, from the vehicle. But that depression, is black and depressed, is what we see with that deep, full thickness burn. Now, the picture you see on the top is actually in an OR suite. It's on its side. Um, there's the lights in the room, the IV pole, and you actually have somebody holding the leg up in the air. So they have just debrided this leg. It was a full, deep, full thickness burn, and they have debrided it. Um, we still have areas of very poor blood flow. That, there is still tissue there that is not viable tissue. But you can also see the tendons in the ankle. Um, that they have debrided that far down into that leg. That patient will go back to the OR again for debridement. Um, many times with deep, full thickness burns, we have to amputate those. 
um, there's many times we're not a able to salvage the, those burns, especially if we hit bone, we have to amputate it. <clears throat> Prior, before we hit bone, uh, they'll try to save them, uh, but many times with those deep full thickness, they, they amputate those. what burns does to the body. Like all we have done is talked about what they look like at the skin layer. Like that is it. We haven't talked about the rest of the body affected by burns. When we talk about burns, you need to know that there are three phases of burns. Before we get started, I'm coming back to the phases and I'm on, we're going to go into those in detail. But for you to understand what's going on, you have to have an understanding of the three phases. So we have the emergent resuscitative phase, which is the very first phase of burns. It lasts about 48 hours. Please don't get fixed on that time frame, and I'll explain that later. But I need you to have an idea of time frame, what we're looking at. <clears throat> Approximately two days. We then have... Um, oh, um, the acute phase of burns. That is the second phase. And that acute phase of burns will last several days, weeks. That, that phase is much longer in time frame. Uh, it can last several weeks. And then we have the rehabilitative phase of burns, and that can last up to 18 months. So when we talk about burns, from this point, um, when we talk about the effects of burns, we are really focusing in those first approximately two days, those first 48 hours of burns, is what we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about. Because the acute phase is just a continuation of this resuscitative emergent phase, and rehabilitative phase is getting the patient to an optimal level of function. So we are really going to spend the majority of our time in 48 hours. So we're going to talk about a ton, but it's really we're talking about a very short time frame that all of this occurs. <clears throat> so when we talk about the effects of burns, the first thing we have to think about is fluid shifting. We have to think about what they call capillary leak syndrome, third spacing. This is vascularly where we see um, a shift in fluid volume from the vascular space to the interstitial space with burns. So the burn occurs, and that is the start time of burns. When the burn occurs is your start time. <clears throat> and with that burn <clears throat> occurs, we have a sympathetic nervous system response. All right? We have a failure of vessels. We have that capillary leak syndrome that occurs, and at that point, we start seeing fluid shift from the vascular space to the interstitial space. Potassium is stored where? Where do we store potassium in our bodies? In the That's important. In the cells. That's right. In the cells. So potassium is stored in the cells. The cells are damaged because of a burn, so potassium is released out of the cells. Where does it go? Mm -hmm. It's opposite of sodium in fluids, so it's going to go where? It's going to stay inside. It's going to the vascular space. So potassium is released from the cells and moves to the vascular space. Fluid is moving out of the vascular space, and sodium is going with it. So now all of a sudden we have a patient whose volume is going to start dropping, vascular volume is going to start coming down, potassiums are going to start rising, sodiums are going to start dropping. What does that do for an H&H? &H? Do what now? It doesn't decrease it. It increases it one. Because you're coming, becoming dehydrated, you're exactly right in the fact of this. So remember, an H&H &H is a percentage. It is the percentage of hematocrit and hemoglobin, right? So let me give you some nightmares with fractions. 
All right, so let's say it is 1% of 10. It's not, but let's say it's 1% of 10 normally. All right, as our volume decreases, our percentage goes up. Does that make sense? Because the total volume has dropped, the hematocrit and hemoglobin rise. Does that mean that we're producing more hematocrit and hemoglobin? No, no it doesn't. It just means that our, our total volume has decreased. So as this total volume decreases, this becomes higher. You're, it's because it's a percentage of the total. So hematocrit and hemoglobin rise. And we'll come back to electrolytes and blood volumes and proteins and albumin. And we're coming back to all of that, I promise. But we have a patient that's vascular volume drops. If their vascular volume drops, what happens to cardiac output? It decreases. It decreases. What happens to stroke volume? What happens to rate? Okay, let's talk about rate. What happens to heart rate? It increases, but the volume decreases, right? Y'all are all still with me. Okay, so vascular volume drops, heart rate goes up, pressure goes down, Cardiac output goes down. So now the rest of the body is being poorly perfused, right? What happens when the body is poorly perfused? It's shut down. Okay, yeah, shut down is ultimately the end. We got to we got lots of steps before we get there. Do it now? Oh, we'll try to compensate. It doesn't last long. Okay, so the body is going to try to compensate by shunning. And so we're going to see peripheral, peripheral vascular constriction, right? We're going to see the body trying to shunt blood back to vital organs. And when we say vital organs, we're talking brain, heart, lungs, sometimes the kidneys. That's our goal is where we're perfusing. But volume is down. And when that volume goes down, we've already talked about the hematocrit and hemoglobin going up, potassium moving to that vascular space. What do you think happens to the consistency of blood? It gets thick. That's right. It gets very sludgy is how it gets. It gets very thick and sludgy. Guess what? It starts microclotting as well because it's very thick and sludgy. There's not a lot of it. It's moving slow. And so we start seeing poor perfusion to tissue. All right, normal metabolism is what in the body? Aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic, right? We change from an aerobic to an anaerobic metabolism of the cells. Why? Because they're not getting the oxygen that they need, right? So we now move into an anaerobic metabolism. The byproduct of an anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. Lactic acid rises, and the patient moves into what type of metabolic state? Acidosis. Metabolic acidosis occurs with burns. Almost all burns are metabolic acidosis. There is only one exception to that, and that is if we hit the airways with some type of injury from the burn. And then we go from metabolic acidosis to respiratory acidosis because the lungs themselves are injured and they're, no longer, they're not able to compensate for the metabolic side of it. So metabolic acidosis is where these patients sit because of low volume. Now, we talked about the, the um, fluid leaving the vascular space, moving to the interstitial space. However, remember they now have tissue that is gone. The skin is burned. There is a direct opening to the environment. And so that fluid doesn't stay in the interstitial space. It leaves the body. 
completely. It's now on the sheets, it's on pads, it's on dressings, it's on the floor. It is, they have massive volume loss through those burn areas because there's no skin to hold that volume in. So when we talk about insensible loss, what is insensible loss? Insensible fluid loss. Okay, sweating is an example of insensible uh, fluid loss. What else? Breathing. But tell me what it is. Those are both examples. It's not measurable. So these patients will have this volume loss. Typically, we lose about 500 mils to a liter today, a day that we can't measure. These patients will have 10, 10 liters a day of fluid loss that's not measurable because it just literally oozes out of them. Um, they already have open skin. They already have problems thermoregulating, and now they're wet. So what happens to body temperature? It drops. So these patients tend to stay cold. So we have to really keep an eye on their body temperature as well. They get cold, what happens to perfusion? It decreases. So you don't just see this snowball effect with burns. Like there is this compounding effect that we are going to talk about through this whole thing. What do you say, Josh? Just depends on how deep the burns are. But there's this snowball effect that we see with burns. So how do we stop it? Volume. Absolutely. And I'm going to preach volume like I stand in a pulpit or something. We are going to talk volume. We're going to talk volume through the Parkland formula. I'm going to give you examples. They're in your blackboard. There's already sheets up for practice problems. You have to know how to do the Parkland formula. Now, let me just tell you and preface it this. The ones that are in Blackboard are not realistic. They're there for you to learn how to do the math. They're not there for you to think that scenario is realistic. Because when a patient is burned over 80% of their total body surface area and there is a two hour delay for them to arrive to an ER, they're dead. They don't survive that. So don't look at these problems and go, oh my gosh, that patient made, no. These are just numbers I made up so that you could practice the math of it. But you have to know the Parkland formula because the Parkland formula is used for the first 24 hours of the burn. This is where we're seeing all of this volume loss. So what we're trying to do is keep up with the loss. We're trying to put enough volume in to equalize the volume lost so that there is perfusion to vital organs. That is our goal through that first 24 hours or so. So we're going to really talk about um, volume and fluid resuscitation um, as we move through this. I'm trying to think, make sure I've covered all of it. I have Of course, these patients have swelling, and the swelling occurs everywhere. So don't think that swelling only occurs or fluid shifting only occurs at the site of the burn. That's not the case. Remember, we have a sympathetic nervous system response. So it, infect, it, it affects the entire body. So we have fluid shifting everywhere, in burned areas and in areas that are not burned. Now, we're going to hold it a little longer in the interstitial space in areas that are not burned because we have the skin that's going to hold it there. We're going to lose it faster in areas that are burned. Does that make sense? But they swell everywhere. They have fluid shifting everywhere. Um, this gentleman was burned on the head, face, and chest area. He is nasally intubated because by the time he got to a facility or somebody that could intubate him, his airways had already started swelling to the point that they couldn't put an ET tube down his throat. They used his nose. Look at the difference in, in those pictures. The tongue, the lips, the face swelling that is occurring in this patient. That's the same thing? That's the same patient. Oh, yeah. He is nasally intubated there. That swelling is so intense and so fast that many times we prophylactically intubate patients. 
25% of their total body surface area or burns to their head, face, chest, neck area, they're going to be prophylactically innovative because we're going to see enough swelling that it can impede airway. So why would you not just trach them instead of intubating them like nasally? That's a good question. That's a great question, as a matter of fact. Let's talk about that. So Josh asks, why would we not trach them versus just nasally or orally the intubating only them? Goes so far. Do it now? I'm assuming that those trach cannulas only go so far. So if you've got... But they're past the vocal cords. That's why they're much shorter. Right. So they can... That's... Why do we... When do we put trachs in patients? Not necessarily non-emergent. Like if there's issues. Okay, so if there, if so, in the ER we trach a lot of patients if there is trauma to the face, head, neck area, and we can't physically find an airway, or they're going to the OR and there's going to be lots of work in that airway, we will trach them. But does this gentleman have trauma to those areas? Is that airway intact? Does he still have? all of his parts and pieces of his neck and throat. Still he does. It's just less it's just invasive. In, it's just invasive. It is less invasive. You're on the right track. We're almost there. Who's in ICU clinicals right now? All right. The patients you have had so far that are intubated, how are they intubated? Orally. Orally. Why? Why didn't we just trach all of those? Because it's what? Not necessary because it's reversible. It's temporary. That's right. That's where we're going. Why do we intubate them? Because remember how long does this phase last? 48 hours. 48 hours is what we're talking about and we're going to see a fluid shift back in these patients. And that swelling is going to start decreasing in about two days. So please don't treat me for two days. <laughs> Orally or nasally intubate me. That's okay. I'm okay with that. We typically trach and peg long term. So in the ER is the exception to that because we do trach in the ER because there's trauma that that structure is gone or is going to be manipulated heavily um, will secure an airway. But in burn patients, it's because it's short term. Just like we hope that we intubate a patient for sepsis short term. We fix the sepsis, we fix the fluid shifting, we get a pressure on these patients and we extubate them. Um, our goal of intubating is not to intubate and keep them there, right? Our goal of intubating is intubating, correcting, and extubating. But here, here he is. I just wanted you to see that swelling. We can see that swelling everywhere. Um, this is very visible on him because he does have burns to that face neck area, but you have to think about that swelling can still occur even if they didn't have those burns at the face because if he had 50% of his total body surface area burn, you would still see him swell like that. So when we talk about the lungs, so we talked cardiovascular, let's look at the lungs. When we talk about lungs, we can have direct injuries and we have indirect injuries. With direct injuries, we are talking about superheated air, steam, flames, even toxins that actually come in contact with the lung, lung tissue, that is a direct injury to the respiratory system or respiratory tract. Lungs can be damaged from things like hydrogen cyanide, by the way, which is the byproduct of plastic burning. So if the patient is in a confined space, they are much more likely to have a respiratory injury than a patient in open air. That just kind of makes sense, right? If you think about it, we're out by a bonfire. It's too hot for one right now, but let's wait until the fall and we'll have us a bonfire outside. We have a burn. We have open air. The lungs are less likely to be injured there than they are on the third floor of this building in a confined space and us having to get down two flights of stairs before we get out. We're more likely to have respiratory injuries in confined spaces than we are in open air. Plastic is hot. The, sign of the byproduct of plastic burning is hydrogen cyanide. Y'all ever heard of cyanide gas? 
Sounds poisonous, right? It's deadly. Yeah. Um, but we see that with plastic. So we tend to see chemicals that are let off when things are burned that we inhale that can cause injuries to the lung. Those are all direct injuries to the lung. Indirect injuries is what we see with pulmonary edema. That is when we see fluid shifting that we have indirect injuries to the lungs. So typically fluid shifting. When we have injuries to the airways, that tissue will slough. In about 48 to 72 hours, that tissue will start sloughing or peeling off. But now we're talking about the lungs and the airways, not the skin. Tissue is still damaged. In about 48 to 72 hours, it will start sloughing off and can actually block airways. So you can have a patient that will 48 hours, three days after a burn, start developing respiratory distress. So let's think about that for a second. I just told you that the swelling occurs for approximately the first 24 hours or so. We're going to talk about the second 24 hours of the resuscitative emergent phase. But swelling occurs for about 24 hours. So we would anticipate respiratory distress in those first 24, 36 hours or so because swelling's occurring, right? That wouldn't surprise us. Airways are swelling. We're having fluid move into the lungs. We may see some pulmonary edema, respiratory distress on the patient. That's anticipated. But as we start seeing a fluid shift in the patient and swelling starts decreasing, would we anticipate having airway issues on the patient? We wouldn't unless there is a burn to the, the tish, lung tissues or airways. And then we have to anticipate in that 48 to 72 hour time frame that tissue sloughing off and blocking the airways. So it would look more like the patient is, of course, the worst in the beginning. They look like they're getting a little bit better and then fall back. Then to all water. of a sudden we have a respiratory stress. And it's pretty sudden. It's kind of like, um, have you ever taken care of a patient with a mucus plug? That all of a sudden that airway is blocked and they are in acute distress. That is what this tissue does, essentially. It just blocks an airway. Um, and so they will, they'll have that respiratory stress. We do the exact same thing for these patients that we do for mucus plugs. We will suction them, we'll do bedside bronx, we will remove that tissue out of those airways to open the airway back up. But we see that sloughing at about 48 to 72 hours. When we talk about the um, GI tract, Remember, we shunt blood from the GI tract. So that is one of those areas that the body, trying to compensate for a drop in pressure and volume, will shunt blood from the GI tract. So it's not unusual for these patients to lose bowel sounds. Now, do we want them to lose bowel sounds? No, because that means we've got poor perfusion, that volume's not high enough. But it's not unusual for them to lose bowel sounds. They can develop paralytic ileuses, and they can also develop curling's ulcers. What are curling's ulcers? Another name for them are stress ulcers. Okay. Yeah, I know you know. Yeah, curling's ulcers. They can develop anywhere in the GI tract, upper or lower. It doesn't matter. And so we have to watch for them. We have to check for them. Because does this patient need a GI bleed on top of a burn? No. No. So what have you just done? What has just happened if they have a GI bleed on top of a burn? They have just put the nail in the coffin. Like they're dead. We can't get them back from hypovolemia and a GI bleed on top of burns. It is that, like that compound effect, um, and they usually don't survive them. So how do we prevent curling's ulcers? Okay, a PPI and H2. H2 blockers. They get both. They get PPIs and H2 blockers.
All right, it's 9, 15, 9 16. Let's take about 10 minutes because I'm losing you. It's a lot of information and we're not even halfway through. <coughs> so, y'all take a few minutes. 